So good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to another Earth Institute Coffee Morning. Um, so this morning, it's really great to welcome a triple act of Angela Feehan, Rainer Meltzer, and Sersha Tracy uh, to talk about their new uh, BioCrop project. And just as a quick plug as well, Angela has also kindly given an Earth Talk, uh, which is now available on the new Earth Talk website. So, uh, which the link was provided in this week's weekly email. So do go and have a, have a look at that if you want to learn more as well from Angela's perspective. Thanks very much. Okay. okay. So it's um, great to get the opportunity to tell you a bit about BioCrop, which is a new uh, DAFN funded project that we have between uh, UCD, Trinity, Chagask and NUI Galway. Uh, we also have partners in Spain and UK and industry partners, including Brandon Bioscience and the spin-out company eSeed. So uh, next slide. So there's lots of different expertise and different people involved in BioCrop. Uh, you can see all the different people here. Um, and I'll mention these people as I go along. OK, next slide. So crop production is really dependent on inputs. And one of the main inputs is plant protection products. Uh, we have a really high disease pressure here um, in Ireland uh, for cereal production. Um, but what has happened in terms of these uh, plant protection products in recent years is concerns around um, environmental impacts and also health impacts. And many of the chemistries that we use have been phased out. So there's a couple of examples here. Uh, chlorothalonil was banned in May last year, and that is a multi-site fungicide uh, that is used to control uh, fungal diseases like uh, ramularia and barley. So that was banned last year. So again, uh, growers are left with less uh, chemistries and left cho less choices. Um, neonicotinoids were banned in 2018, and so they were used to control aphids. Aphids will spread barley yellow dwarf virus. They do that as they feed. Um, and those were banned. So neonics were banned in 2018. Again, uh, growers are left with less chemistries and less choices. Um, next slide. The other main input is manufactured fertilizers. Um, so the concerns here are really the high energy costs uh, to make the fertilizers. And again, things like runoff. Um, and greenhouse gas emissions. So I think 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, from tillage are actually associated with the manufacture of these fossil-based fertilizers. So what are we gonna do in biocrop? Okay, I've jumped ahead. <laughs> so uh, the EU is really concerned about these inputs and the environmental impact. So as part of the farm to fork strategy, they want us to reduce pesticide use by 50%. They want us to reduce uh, fertilizer use by 20%. Okay, so this is part of the farm to fork uh, strategy. So in biocrop, we're going to do a few different things to try and address uh, and look for alternatives to these um, fossil based fertilizers and also plant protection products. So one is look for um, beneficial microbes, so endophytes, and Fiona's going to do that with uh, Trevor at Trinity. Um, we're going to look for different bite pesticides, so antifungals, Olga and Magrips busy doing that, and also uh, Galway are looking for antifungals from seaweed. The biostimulants will be tested in the field to control things like barley yellow dwarf virus and ramularia, and Chagas are going to do that, uh, Stephen and, and Louise. Um, I'll let Rainer and Sersha talk more about the fossil-based fertilizer alternatives. Then Finul Murphy in Biosystems will be looking at life cycle assessment of these bioproducts because are we just swapping one environmental impact uh, for another? So we need to know that these are actually, these bioproducts are more sustainable. And then Fiona Thorne and Michael Wallace at UCD will be looking, uh, Fiona's at Chagask, will be looking to create a bioeconomic model uh, for the crop sector. So is this, um, economically viable? Are these products economically viable as well? Okay, so I'll hand over to Rainer and Sersha who will tell you more about uh, alternatives to fossil-based fertilizers. So uh, Angela, so I, what I'm, or what Sersha and I am going to do is, is talking a little bit uh, 
more in detail about uh, task four that Angela just mentioned. That is um, a comparison of bio-based fertilizers to fossil fertilizers. Um, so Angela mentioned already that nitrogen inputs are actually a huge problem in current agriculture. Of course, they are hugely beneficial as well, right? So the population growth we, we have seen in the past 100 years would not have been possible without artificial many, uh, industrial producers. However, uh, that those industrial fertilizers also, the production of them consumes about 1% of the world's total energy supply. Um, and because the plants are not hugely efficient, well, they are efficient at taking up the nitrogen, but uh, there's always a certain component of leaching of the nitrogen into the soil. And that leads to increased eutrophication. And there are actually projections that uh, with a projected fertilizer uh, increase in fertilizer use, uh, we may see a 2.5 fold increase in eutrophication in the future. And then due to the entire nitrogen cycle, we also see uh, emission of N2O uh, into the atmosphere, but, which is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas. So 28% of the net anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions are actually coming from N2O. Um, so all this leads to a kind of consideration that we need to reduce fertilizer inputs. And one one potential answer to reduce those fertilizer inputs is actually the use of biostimulants. Now, what are biostimulants? So the, the, the definition of those is actually relatively broad. So there are substances that enhance uh, nutrient uptake, uh, nutrient efficiency, and that can also enhance the tolerance to abiotic stress and may enhance also crop quality. And uh, so bio nutrients can actually be a lot of different, uh, biostimulants, sorry, can be a lot of different materials. So, um, so there can be, they can be fungi, for example, that interact with the plant and enhance nutrient uptake or bacteria that work in a similar manner. But there are also seaweed extracts, for example, that, um, that work by a mechanism that is actually not entirely clear, uh, enhance nitrogen uptake of the plant. Okay, so there's a huge variety of, of biostimulants and um, they are suspected or there's evidence in some cases that uh, they contribute to plant growth and that they may help to reduce uh, the input of, of fertilizer. Uh, and what we, what we want to do in this task of the BioProp project is actually to characterize some of those biosimulants in more detail, compare really their efficiency to current fertilizer applications. And, but in parallel to that, we would also like to analyze the impact of those biostimulants uh, on grain quality uh, and on greenhouse gas emissions in particular. And why is this important? Now it's important because uh, there are a lot of biostimulants currently on the market, but data uh, on their efficiency is really relatively scarce. Now, if you ask a farmer to use a biostimulant and reduce fertilizer input by 25%, for example, of course, um, you need, I think, strong evidence to show that this doesn't impact the yield or the quality of the grain because it's their livelihood. And um, so one, one goal of BioCrop is really to provide those data and to show or to study whether those biostimulants really can replace fertilizer and to which extent they can replace it. So we work with um, three different products that are listed here. So one uh, is provided by a company that is uh, called Brandon Bioscience um, and it's a seaweed extract. Aramar. So uh, the second product is provided by Novo. This is a, a, a bacillus ferment that is enriched with, with humic and fulvic uh, acid extracts. And then we have a cooperation with the University of Seville, and they provide us with a hydrolyzed yeast product 
that is actually made from brewery based. So what we try to do with this is we try to, to, to capture the range of the biostimulants that are available. So we have uh, uh, algae products, we have bacterial based products, and we have uh, uh, organic waste products. And we will analyze all of them in greenhouse uh, experiments and in field experiments. Now the general setup of, uh, of those experiments is that we, two PhD students will do the actual work. Talking, but um, Connor Blunt, uh, he, he is working mainly on the greenhouse trials. Marie Luz uh, is working with Searsha on the field trials. So the, the aim of this is really that we apply those biostimulants in initially in pilot experiments uh, and then analyze greenhouse gas emissions, grain quality, grain yield. Uh, in comparison to traditional fertilizer. Now I'm handing over now to Searsha to explain the details of, of the experiment a little bit more. Thanks, Raina. So I'm supervising Mary Luce, who's the, the field PhD. So she'll be conducting the field trials at Lyons. But this year is really kind of a foundation year. The two PhDs, Connor and Mary Luce, are working together in Rosemount in Glasshouse trials to try and pinpoint some of the information we need about application rates, dose, all those kind of things. So we'll be able to translate the Glasshouse trials directly into the field trials. And we were really lucky that um, um, Eddie, the farm manager at Lyons Farm, we were able to get a load of soil from Lyons to Rosemount. So the two PhDs have been sieving, lots and lots of sieving for the, for the field trials. So there'll be soil-based information that we get from the glasshouse trials and the soil is obviously coming from lions where we're going to be doing the field trials so hopefully that jump that translation we can make quite nicely from year one with the glasshouse trials into we're going to do three years of um, field trials as well and Mary Luce is going to be doing lots of phenotyping as well as in the glasshouse we're going to be looking at grain quality get yield yield data as well and work quite closely with people like Glambia and Diageo to make sure that those grain quality traits that we're getting out are relevant for the market. Uh, next slide, please. This is just um, a layout really of all the different products you can see. So um, maybe jump onto the next slide as well because that'll probably tell us more. So you can see we've got lots of pots because we have the three different products. We've got diff different application rates. Um, so yeah, you can get an idea of really how much soil the students have had to sieve, but thankfully we've got something called a a multi-drum, which is essentially a cement mixer with a sieve that's really sped up the process um, up at Rosemount, which is really handy. But I really like the link between Lions and Rosemount in terms of the research we're doing. So hopefully we'll get a lot of information out from there. And then just the next slide, please. These are some of the analytical procedures that we need to really get a handle on in year one. So the phenotyping, what are the traits that we need to measure to give this information back to the growers for the field trials, we are going to be working on winter barley. So there's two varieties, cassia and craft. So these we know from talking to the, because this is such a big project and it's so, there's so many stakeholders involved, we're able to get information from growers and from companies about what's the information they need. Um, and these are two varieties of interest. We're going to be working out, yeah, well, we'll get yield data from the harvester and grain quality analyses and then uh, Grace Cott is working with um, Raina and Connor Blunt on the greenhouse gas emissions analyses as well. So hopefully we can get all of this information about how do the products work? What do they have a reduction in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions compared to fossil based fertilizers, the controls? And really, if we can, we want to get information about what's happening below ground as well. So maybe the migration in the soil or how even logistical things, if, if say farmers are gonna take on these new novel products, how do they use them? When do they use them? How do they store them? These are all kind of questions we want to get out to be able to give straight back to the growers. And then the next slide. Yeah, so this for years two to four, it'll be really just a con continuation to get more information out and to validate and check that what we saw in year one is what we're seeing out in the field as well. 
So I think that's everything. Um, thank you very much, and we're happy to take questions. That's great. Thanks very much, guys. Um, does anyone have any questions? Stop screen sharing, maybe. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Very nice project. Um, so I have a question. Uh, just going, going back to one of Reiner's points that uh, you know, in order to convince a grower using those biostimulants, you need to show good evidence that they work. Uh, but of course, for us, they could work maybe, they work in different ways. So for example, just to make it very, very practical, it might be that the biostimulant end up into a yield which is slightly less than you would get if you use fertilizer, but it's much more sustainable. So you could argue with the grower that yes, you're gonna have a slightly smaller yield, but it's much more sustainable in the long term. So you should use it. So the question is, what is a good result for you? So, you know, because if you're gonna get 50% less yield, it would be complicated. Maybe if you're gonna get three quarter, maybe you could argue for it. So what is, what is, what are you looking forward to? What is the, what would, what would you consider a good outcome uh, when you compare in terms of yield and quality of the crop when you compare by, uh, the, fertil the classical fertilizers with your biostimulant? So I think the ideal outcome would be that the financial, that there is no net financial loss to the farmer, right? So if you have, for example, a little bit of a reduced yield, but you can reduce the fertilizer input and you save money by that, then it doesn't make a net difference to the, to the financial income of the farmer. So that would be the ideal outcome. Now, if we have, uh, or maybe the ideal outcome would be have, would would be having more yields with less fertilizer anyway. But so if we have a situation where the biofertilizer or the biostimulant reduces yield, but it is hugely beneficial for greenhouse gas emissions, uh, I think this, well, I can't really answer that at the moment. I can't give a hard number. I think this is then also a policy question. I think, so I would think one can't expect the farmer to take a hit on his income for the benefit of the greater good. I think the um, policy decisions need then to be brought into place to say, okay, look, the, the yield is maybe reduced, but the environmental impact is so huge that we, that we kind of balance that yield loss with, I don't know, some kind of subsidies or so. But I, um, we are in, in uh, contact with companies like Glenbia were really interested into that because they they want to uh, they want to make agriculture more sustainable. I think there's definitely that is at least my feeling. There's a there's a push from the industry also to to make agriculture more sustainable. But eventually, I think there are also policy decisions that need to be made in this direction. Thank you. Any, any other questions or any other thoughts around that one? So that, that was, well, I had a question along similar lines actually as well, you know, whether there was a, whether farmers were inherently receptive to this kind of, these kinds of innovations. I think, you know, fantastic that they're, that they're in development. Um, but the, are the farmers themselves having a, a sort of mixed reaction in, initially in your, in your sense, or are there, is there a kind of enthusiasm, as you kind of said at the end of that comment, Reiner, that, you know, that the industry does want to see this kind of, this kind of change. So I guess there's been opportunities for these kinds of changes in, in the past, and they're not always as well taken up as they might be. Well, you want to answer that, Angela? Yeah. I guess it's been uh, kind of forced by the, the EU, really, by the, by the policies, things like the farm, the fork strategy. So if you, you know, as you phase out things like, um, you know, the fungicides that, that people are using uh, and, you, and you're saying that you want a 20% reduction in fertilizers, then I think the response of the industry, so for example, the enthusiasm from Glambia is probably <laughs> forced by the, by the things like the farm to fork uh, strategy. Yeah, that makes sense. Tommy. Yeah, thanks for the presentations, everyone. Um, 
I suppose maybe to change the focus slightly back to my own area of comfort, um, there's a lot of nitrogen fertilizer go out on the grasslands. Um, have you any work planned in that area or is there, is there scope for using the biostimulants to increase the efficiency of nitrogen on grasslands? Thank you. Uh, so Tommy, we do have another project that is looking at biostimulants on, on grassland. Um, so definitely the information we're going to take from this is we're just working on barley. It's just going to be a cereal crop. But a lot of the products, like the Terramar products, are already used on different crops. So they use them on horticultural crops and grasslands. So we think whatever may be inherent mechanism that's making these things work, and we need to obviously get a lot more data on how they're working, should be highly conserved across plant species. So definitely alongside the other projects, like I'm working with Olaf on, on biostimulants in grassland, we're hoping there could be exchange of information laterally as well. Thanks, Thanks, I was I was kind of struck by the level of, of collaboration within with industry and and kind of industrial partners I think which is really great to see were those uh, relationships easy to develop or uh, have they been in place for a long time or is that kind of a, a, a new thing that, that you had to work on for this particular project when Nova Q came on board once the project was funded, because obviously a lot of companies are really keen on getting information and having their products tested. So in NovaQ, um, some of their employees are ex-graduates uh, of the AES program in UCD. So there's already kind of a UCD connection. And I know, um, Reina, do you want to talk about Brandon Bioscience? Yeah, I think there were pre-existing con uh, connections between Brandon Bioscience and UCD as well. Uh, I, I think Angela may know more about that. No? Okay. I think Carl also, is Carl here? Carl also has a project with them. So um, my, my impression is that the companies in general, they're very, uh, uh, Brent Bioscience, for example, is very scientifically driven. So they publish papers on their products and uh, they do transcriptome analysis and things like that. So they do not only want to to throw out a pro product on the market, but they really want to show that it does work and also how it works. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I think for me, my, my impression is the companies are really interested in this and the um, collaborations look really promising. Yeah. Both, both are already doing lots of their own field trials. Uh, yeah, just to mention, so the ECs is actually like a spin-out company. So that was um, Fiona Duhan and Trevor Hodkinson at uh, Trinity. So they actually have a spin-out company, which is the EC, the end of my um, company. Okay. Was there a direct co-fund as part of the, the funding? So, so they, they give us the products uh, and their know-how uh, and there's a couple of industry placements there as well for the PhD students. Brilliant. But yeah, so no direct cash, but definitely yeah. like access That's, to the product. Yeah, great. Uh, Dheeraj? Uh, thanks, Tessman. Uh, it was really interesting talk and, and the project is very good, um, uh, definitely. Um, uh, my question is more from the application side of these biostimulants. Um, like there are different doses of fertilizer supplied or fungicide supplied. Um, are you going to test different doses and time points of applications of, of these biostimulants? Yeah, we're hoping a lot of that information we can glean from the glasshouse trials, but already Marilus is planning the field, the field trials. So yeah, we're, we're going to have to really have some guidance from the companies about when, the, when they sh recommend applying. But yeah, we'll be changing things like application rates, dose, timing to kind of get that kind of perfect recipe of what gives you the best result. So yeah, a lot of data collection. And uh, thanks for that. Um, it, is this uh, the mode of application? Is this a seed treatment or, or a foliar application? That's something else that we want to look at different options as well. So because even some of the different products recommend different application types. So it could be foliar, could be like just adding straight to the soil. And Marilus has experience of seed coating as well. So yeah, I think we're gonna, we're gonna try multiple things to just to see what really is, like I said, the best kind of recipe. 
then the last one thanks <laughs> um because you are using compounds or or the biostimulants from different sources and their mode of application is different are you going to look into a recipe where you will be applying all these three or four in one treatment just to see if the combined effect is higher compared to just one treatment yeah we've considered like a cocktail or a pick and mix but i think initially especially for the first year one we just have to get the baseline information and see which ones works maybe some won't and we might have to drop them for later years but yeah potentially that kind of cocktail application could could be um worth it i think one of the companies described it as like a prebiotic and a probiotic you kind of add the two together maybe to get the biggest boost okay thank you that's great thanks so there's a question from mona um in the chat asking for a bit of explanation around life cycle assessment of using fertilizers and the stages involved in the standards and uh, its bearing on this kind of project. Uh, so the life cycle assessments uh, will be performed by uh, Fidel Murphy and Biosystems, so not, not my expertise, but from what I understand, uh, they, she will look at how the products are manufactured, how they're applied, um, and any waste from those products. So basically looking at the environmental impacts of each stage of manufacture, use, and then any waste, and then put that uh, together to look and see what um, the environmental impacts are, and then compare that with conventional uh, fertilizers. So that's my understanding of, of the life cycle. Brilliant. That's right through the process. Great stuff. Plus, in addition to that, I think we're going, so together with Grace, she, she's co-supervisor of Connor. She, she will do the greenhouse gas emission analysis, which will also be part of the life cycle assessment. Great. Uh, Olaf has a question there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. It sounds a really exciting project, so best of luck with it. I was really uh, intrigued by and that's a mark that, you know, the companies have shared the know-how with you. Now, I just look at the list if they're here because it's maybe not very nice to talk about them, but I was just interested, Angela, do they actually know the mechanisms, how these things work? And I was just interested if you could maybe give us some example, you know, if you are planning to investigate the actual, you know, mechanism process, or is it like, you know, you know, you know, you know, is it the root functions? Is it, uh, you know, endophytes? Is it micronutrients? Is it silicon? You know, is it the microbes in the soil? Because, it, you know, with industry, it usually is, you know, you throw something on and it's a silver bullet and it works, but this is not really what we want to know. So I was just intrigued there. <laughs> Thanks. I'll let, so I'll, I'll let Sersha follow on with, with maybe the soil uh, part of the question, but so in terms of how they work, no, we're not looking at that in this project, but I have, we have had a, a previous project where we looked at a, um, a biostimulant and this is where things get kind of a little bit fuzzy because, so we looked at a product before for all tech uh, crop science and it's, uh, it was developed as a biostimulant, but actually when we looked at how it works, it actually induces defense genes in the plant. And so it was protecting the plant from uh, fungal diseases by actually switching on the plant's own kind of defense system. Um, it also had directly antifungal properties as well. And this is kind of, so there's these definitions about what a biostimulant is and what, what a biopesticide is, and they're quite strict. But for me, actually, the reality of what they're doing is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah, so yeah, if you want to. Comments, Ursha. Just to say, I think Olaf will try and delve as deep as we can in terms of the mechanism. Like we're trying to measure lots of different areas, like the soil, the greenhouse gas, uh, Rhino and his like genetics background. So hopefully we can kind of dig deep. But I think initially it's more just which of the products actually work, and yeah, hopefully there'll be scope for that. Yeah, lots of scope. Brenton has done. Brenton Bioscience has done a little bit of research on their. Um, seaweed product and what they see in horticultural crops like tomato is that that it upregulates nitrate transporters so it, it increases nitrate use efficiency relatively directly now 
but that is a general mechanism or not, I don't know. Um, uh, I, my, my assumption would be it is relatively general. So for the bacteria, I don't have information about those bacteria in, uh, specifically, but there is data out there saying that bacteria can produce also phytohormones that influence uh, plant growth. Uh, so this is a potential mechanism maybe, but as Angela said, we're not, in this project, we are not looking into the details. Very good, thanks very much and good luck. So, so we've got, uh, there's time for one more quick question from Finbar, who's got a hand raised there. Yeah, thanks, uh, Taz. That's a really, really interesting project. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, I guess, in kind of the, the public attitude and perhaps attitude of farmers as well to, I guess, issues or um, substances called biopesticides, biofertilizers. I'm just wondering, for example, if the uh, local community around, you know, a huge farm suddenly found out that they were using biopesticides or biofertilizers, uh, would there be a backlash? Would there be a lack of understanding of what exactly these things are, and uh, I, ju I just wondering, is there kind of is there scope to uh, involve uh, the public, get the public perceptions of these types of um, entities uh, in the project, or is that something you're not you're not going to be looking at in uh, in this particular project? Uh, it's a really good idea, actually. It's probably something we probably should have included, uh, but. I don't know is kind of the answer, I guess. People like the word bio, don't they? <laughs> um, bio we don't know, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> bio is usually seen as something that's fairly uh, fairly friendly. Um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know what public perceptions of, I mean, I don't know. So I guess public perceptions of things like um, fungicide use or pesticide use would probably be quite negative, I'd say. Um, uh so my assumption is they would be pro bio based products um in terms of growers there was actually i think it was an article in i don't know if it was the farmers journal or farmers weekly uh, actually the other day um about using these bio stimulants and how they can um help with yield so i, I think Again, the farmers and the industry is kind of being pushed by the EU. Um, but yeah, maybe it's something that we, we should think about in terms of public public opinion. Yeah, a colleague of mine, uh, Owen O'Neill, he's uh, running a project looking at attitudes to the bioeconomy. So it might be an idea maybe to do, just uh, touch base with him on this. Brilliant. Great. Can you send these details then or pass them on? We'll do. Great. Okay, brilliant. We're sorry, we, we're over time. There's a lot of interest in, in the project and it is a fantastic project to see and I really wish you the very best with it. Lots of really interesting innovations there. Um, so uh, as I said at the beginning, don't forget to check out Angela's Earth Talk on the, on the website, which is there in the chat. Uh, and thanks very much again for the, the presentations and thanks everyone for joining us and engaging in the discussion there. Thanks. Thank you.